So let's talk through some February results. We are off to a freaking hot year so far. We're at 88 closed accounts if you count March. So we're you guys are crushing it. You guys are doing amazing. We've paid out over $80,000 in commission that's already in your guys' bank accounts, and I'm super stoked on it all. This week, I want to talk about a little bit of the onboarding process and how we can improve it to start leveraging more referrals in the future and get away from some of those clawbacks. Let's get started. First, some recognition. First off, Ethan. Slow month for Ethan. Closed down two contracts and three units. Awesome job, Ethan. Uh, we also had Sawyer pulled down a duplex with two doors. Awesome job, Sawyer. This was a big investor that Sawyer brought on. So this same investor has already brought on a triplex this month. And I think they're bringing on a fourplex later this month as well. So Sawyer brought on a little bit of a whale there. Great job, Sawyer. Andrew came in with a huge month. Got three management contracts and four units. Had one duplex there. Awesome, awesome job, Andrew. And then Fran, Fran brought in two contracts. One of them was a fiveplex. So she brought in six units for the month. Fran loves those little baby units, those seven, $800 rentals. Max brought in the counter door, staying steady for his first two months here in the investment partner. Awesome job, Max. David, huge month, four single family homes, four doors. Awesome, awesome job, David. Diego, staying active, brought in one management contract for a unit. Awesome job, Diego. Austin also brought in a management contract for a unit. We got to hear last month a little bit about his story, how he did that. Daniel, awesome job. Brought in a triplex there. Great gross rent on that triplex. Awesome job, Daniel. And again, I mentioned it at the beginning of the, the slides was uh, our goal for the year is 300 doors added. We're already at 88 with a third, was it 12 days left to go in the month. So we're going to close out probably closer to 100. So I think we'll be getting a nice little adjustment in our goals for 2024. Keith called me out when I initially said it and said, no chance, man, you're way too low. And so I'm happy to see you guys are proving me wrong, proving Keith right. The one I want to kind of emphasize on here is the 18 transactions. Getting to that point, we had Lonnie uh, close a transaction this month, actually, that he got from investment partners. So he uh, got an investment partner that he signed up in December. They were a big portfolio talk to the owner about possibly buying in the future and uh, close on a deal this month. And I think he just went off the camera. If he's long through there, I'll let you show the story, but if not, okay, there you are. Yeah. Lonnie, you want to share anything more about the story? Yeah. Um, I mean, it was just, you know, it started with, you know, working with them, what they need. And once we got their, their portfolio on board, I went and sat down with them and said, Hey, are you guys still looking to, to grow this portfolio? I mean, it looks like it's pretty big. And they were like, yeah, we're always looking for a good deal. And so then it just, every week I would send them updates. Sometimes it was just, hey, nothing good is on the market. Nothing, nothing worth buying. And then my last conversation with him, he was like, hey, I bought this other thing. I want you guys to rent it out. And I want to tell you, you're my guru. Anything that comes across my plate that doesn't come from you, I'm going to send it to you so you can double check it. You're my guy now. And so it's, we've kind of formed a relationship um, and we're going to buy more stuff later in the year. So it's turned into something that's already paid me thousands of dollars. And I imagine it'll pay me more in the dividends in the future. Most definitely. The most important thing I heard you say was you've built that relationship right? And that's like the key there is, you know, we start with just solving this initial problem for them, but the goal is to build that into a, a bigger relationship. And now this investor sees Lonnie as his guide, no matter what he takes a look at, he's going to run it by Lonnie first. That's a significant amount of trust, guys. Significant amount of trust. All right. As always, a reminder, to reach out to Brett with all your questions. Um, last week, we talked about you guys do have those really t technical questions, those really uh, technical owners, high C's, they want to know every little detail. Maybe they're experienced landlords and they have a lot of questions about how the processes work. Um, just get them on a three-way call with Brett. Brett will walk them through all the technical stuff. That way you guys can focus on the relationship part of it, building the trust. And Brett can focus on the nuts and bolts, the, the X's and Y's and all that great stuff. Onboarding update. So I don't know if you guys have heard yet. Kelly is no longer with us. She uh, got into the role thinking she's going to be doing a little bit more agent mentoring, not so much property management onboarding. And so uh, we kind of mutually agreed to part ways last week. 
And so right now I'm actually handling onboardings, which I'm very much enjoying because it's teaching me a lot about the process. And then uh, starting next week, I'm going to start training Chelsea. Actually, she's a current property manager and she's going to be transitioning into more of a support role doing client success manager. I think this is going to be an awesome change. I really do. Chelsea has onboarded a ton of clients as a property manager, and she knows the process inside and out right now, like as well or better than anybody else. And so she's going to be able to talk very intelligently to these clients. Also, for those of you who have gotten to work with her so far, you know she has the gift of gab. Uh, she is a very fun, uh, she has a fun, great energy, and clients are just going to absolutely love her. So right now, I'm working on the onboarding. I'm refining how the process works. I'm more of an operations person. And then Chelsea's going to hop in, and she's going to make it 10 times better by inserting her personality into a system that I can create. So I'm super, super excited for her to take on this role, and I think it's going to have a huge impact for everybody. I know that it's going it to result in more referrals and less clawbacks. I know this. And so kind of on that token with the clawbacks, for those, those of you guys that have experienced it, it sucks, right? Clawbacks are like one of the worst things about all. It's the most work for you. It's the most work for the onboarder. And it's the most work for the property manager and nobody gets paid. And so we want to avoid those as much as possible. So kind of a couple couple tips for you guys is to, to help the onboarding team and help the operations team is first off, like, please just do not schedule any follow-up steps. Please don't tell them like, hey, somebody will be here Monday or Tuesday or any day or what, anything like that. What you want to do is build value and them getting in the phone with Chelsea and so that she can schedule those steps. And so one of the things that I've already improved upon in the onboarding process from taking it over is I'm not like handing things over to the property manager to have them schedule it. As the onboarder, I'm just directly scheduling things. And it's making, it's cutting down on the confusion. It's making things happen so much faster. Um, and it's creating a lot of clarity too, because we're just establishing that timeline on the call. And I'm live just pulling up like the leasing agent's calendar, the property manager's calendar. And I'm just putting those things live into their process. And so the, I'm saying to the owner, like, hey, I'm, I'm doing this. And I, as I'm doing it, I'm telling them what I'm doing. And it's just, I've, I've like, I'm reading their body language as I'm doing it. I'm seeing a lot of like relief and it, loss of anxiety. It's making the people feel really good. Um, number two is if you have an owner who has a lot of urgency, the best thing that you can do is actually just get the keys from them rather than trying to schedule for the next person to get the keys or who's going to get the keys. You just get the keys from them and either the leasing agent can pick them up directly from you or you can set up a lockbox on the property and then the leasing agent can just start accessing directly from there. Again, that's going to make the owner feel like the process has started and it's going to alleviate their anxiety. Um, so like the hardest thing you can do is like try to hand it off to somebody else because then that creates a lot of confusion. Um, and then the onboarder has to get updated. The property manager has to get updated. The leasing agent has to get updated. People are usually all three of those people are usually calling Keith or Brett being like, Hey, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> and so we had a couple instances where I was doing the onboarding where that happened. Um, it got smoothed out, but I can tell you for sure that if the, the investment partner had just gotten the keys themselves, it'd have been like no questions asked at all. And then last is if the owner does need a walkthrough of any of the properties, you guys should just go ahead and take care of that process with them. How it works is what, once the property management company takes over, we do a post move out inspection, kind of like how you guys submit offers and do the type forms for the information. We just do that same thing with the property managers, go and do a type form at the property. And it's very thorough. It takes them like 45 minutes to go through it. And this is all hitting all the important stuff that we need to know from a rental basis. My personal experience is when an owner wants to take you through a walkthrough, they want to show you a bunch of things that don't actually matter for the property management company. And then also that walkthrough is a great opportunity for you to build that relationship. So like Lonnie alluded to it, he's already gotten a sale from one of those people he signed up just two months ago. Like that is the goal here. That is the bigger commission that we're looking for. And so doing a walkthrough is a great way to build a build relationship. We're going to be spending 20, 30 minutes with them, chatting about things about the home, chatting about things about their personal life. And that relationship is going to be so much deeper after that. Do please take notes in that situation because there might be certain things in there that they want communicated back on. But I can tell you for the most part, the property management company has their own process of this inspection that we, we don't really want the owners involved and in. we want to be able to do it with peace and walking through and, um, and taking our time and taking the notes properly that are all the important things that we follow when we're doing it. And then on the note of taking notes, so if you guys do take notes and do communicate things with the owners, 
please pass that along to the onboarding team. From doing the onboardings, uh, I did one of Ethan's. Ethan, I think, is still with his appraiser right now, so he can't kind of share this with you. But in my onboarding with him, he shared with me that he had an owner that was like very nervous about the entire process. And like JS, you actually even talked to her, the lady Gwen. She was very nervous about everything. She's never had a rental before. She's never even had a friend who's had a rental before. And so everything she every step she was very, very nervous about. But because Ethan had given me so many good notes about the process and notes that things about things they discuss, and I happen to know a personal a couple of personal personal things about Ethan, I was able to say to her a few times, like, well, Ethan said to me this, and and Ethan said that. And then she told me like she worked at the UC Merced. And I was like, oh, well, do you know Ethan's mom? She also works at the UC Merced. And I could see her body language just like really adjusting in a very positive way. Every time I brought up Ethan's name or reference Ethan said something, she felt more comfortable each time I mentioned it. And it's because it, she made she felt like she knew me and knew the process really well by having that relationship from Ethan and knowing that Ethan and I had communicated well. And I, Kyle, saw, actually, I, uh, I saw the reaction. Yeah. But Ethan? So I was say, I, uh, I actually finished my appraisal and I can uh, kind of talk on that a little bit more too, if you don't mind. Every single time, I, I don't know if this prevents any sort of drawbacks or clawbacks, um, but anytime I sign up a person, I always try to send an email to whoever the onboarding director is at the time to give them background on who that person is, what their situation's like, and some notes on them just so then when they go into the meeting, they're like, oh, okay, I can kind of communicate with them better. I know, you know, what they're looking for um, and what kind of personality type they have. Like if I know the board type A, then I'll tell Destiny and I'll also tell the onboarding person, yeah, they're very type A, you know, so they know how to communicate with them in the best way possible. Yeah, I can tell you made a huge difference. I've done five onboarding calls so far, and I think that was my that was my most nervous Nelly owner that I onboarded. But I think it was also the one that went over the best, and it was because I had so much great information ahead of time. Ethan also provided the exact comparable rentals to me that he had provided to her. And so it was very easy for me to have a rental conversation with her because I wasn't bringing up new things to her or different ideas. We were, me, Ethan and I were in full alignment in everything we discussed. On that onboarding note, this is, has anybody ever heard of this book before, Never Lose a Customer Again? Okay, it's an awesome book. I highly recommend it. Highly, highly recommend it. It's really, really great. It's not just for onboarding. It's just for cu customer experience. It's all about the client experience, not giving customer service because customer service is reactive. Client experience is proactive. It's the things that you set up ahead of time, the things you proactively do to make a customer a rating fan. And so the book goes through these eight different phases and these eight different phases are assess. So the assess phase is the customer kind of deciding if they want to do business with you and they're they're really like learning about the organization and then they're sharing their expectations of of what it is of you and the company moving forward that's the place where you guys all live the most is the success phase um, next it goes into the admit phase so the admit phase is like when they say yes the admit phase is when they admit that they have a problem or they need you and that they believe that you can solve it so that's like what you guys are going for is that admit phase right and then they flow into the firm phase. So the firm phase is an interesting one. And, and you guys have probably experienced this yourself before. The firm phase is known as like buyer's remorse. It's that feeling after you sign something or pay for something and you're like, oh shit, what did I just do? Is this actually going to solve my problems? Did I just make a huge mistake? And so we're going to focus a lot on this affirm phase, reinforcing their decision Next is the activate phase. So the activate phase is the onboarding call. That's when we're like putting things into action. It's no longer just a relationship, but now it's like how we're going to deliver on the promises. So again, if you guys are making promises in the success phase or, or finding out why they're going into the admit phase, it's really important in the activate phase that we know those things because then they can communicate it and repeat it back to them. That's what's going to make them feel the most comfortable. Then it goes into the acclimate phase, which is the phase where they are going to learn about how the process works and how they're going to do business. And so we're setting up a, um, Kevin's actually gone through and filmed a bunch of videos already that are like educational videos for the owner that helps acclimate them to how the process works. Those are going to be super helpful. David gave us a good, gave me good feedback yesterday was even just a welcome video initially when they signed their contract, letting them know it's coming up. And so that's something that we're going to add there too. So David, thanks for giving me that feedback. Anytime you guys give me feedback, I hope you guys see, like we want to implement these things for you guys to improve the process. And so if you guys ever think of anything that can help any of these eight phases, 
let me know, let Brett know, let Keith know, like we are absolutely going to implement th- anything to make this better. After that, it goes into accomplish. And like, that's the one I want to talk about because, and Justin alluded to this. So there's a celebration that can happen when you have, when you are in this process. Right. And so one celebration is when they sign the contract and that can help the firm that can help them feel better about the decision they just made. And that's what Justin talked about earlier. There's also this celebration of the accomplished phase. So when somebody does admit, go through the admit phase, they realize they admit that they have a problem and that we can fix it. If you know what that specific problem is, if you can focus on that one thing that's the most important to them and communicate along the way, then at this accomplished portion, we get the opportunity to have a huge celebration around that being accomplished. So if someone has a tenant who's not paying rent, we need to get them evicted. That one's obvious, right? We know what we need to accomplish. We then can create a huge celebration with them when that's followed through on. That's going to make them feel really great about that decision that they made to move forward with this, right? If it was just feel something as simple as filling a vacancy, when that lease gets signed, we're implementing a process. So you guys actually find out about that as well. So you guys can celebrate with that with them as, as well. They're going to remember that moment then, and they're going to tie you to that positive feeling. And so we're going to create more specialty and more remark, remarkable moments in this accomplishment phase. And the more we know about what goal they're trying to solve, the better we're going to be able to do it. Next is the adopt phase. So they're taking ownership of the relationship. They're kind of leading the charge on deepening that and strengthening that bond. And this last phase, the advocate phase is what we're all leading up to. So we want to get more referrals in the future. We want this to be you guys as the investment partners behind signing up people's friends, people's family members, everybody that they know that owns rental properties. So you can triple, quadruple the commissions that you're making on one deal, right? And so that's what this whole life cycle is really improving upon and getting. And um, another good feedback that Daniel gave today is, um, yesterday, excuse me, is we're going to start doing surveys after 100 days. And one of the things that we're going to ask them about in that survey is like why they even uh, decided to move forward in the first place. And, and so then we can start building data around that and really understanding and understanding why people are going with us. And we can build more value specifically around those programs. So kind of what I touched on is the three phases to pay the most attention to uh, for you guys um, are the assess phase, which is where you're already paying, spending all your attention, but spending more time communicating what happens in that assess phase so that we can do a better job in the activate phase. Um, and then number two, really keying in on why they admitted that they had a problem. And I, I think this one's really important and I actually want to get your guys' feedback on this. Um, let me even just pull up the list and I'll call on people. So Will... On 248 Grove, what did the customer admit they had a problem with and that they believed you could solve it? Like, what would you call that admit phase there? There were two things. One, the current, she has another property, she has another house on the property, and that man, that property management company is charging a high amount. So it, 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 was, a, it was a lot. So basically, um, she was being overcharged, I guess. So she was she was very happy with the seven percent. The other thing was she was trying to sell sell the property, and she and it wasn't selling in this market. So she wanted to move to a property management company. So those were kind of the two the two things. But yeah, she was being overcharged on property management with her other property. Yeah. So she's price conscious, and then it sounds like also the sale she's not getting like what she hopes to accomplish done right. So. Those were huge. Max, what did 88 Lakeshore, what was their admit that that kind of got them into the fold? Honestly, and he said this to me, he said personality. Nice. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I guess. Um, but yeah, I guess we kind of just clicked. He's he's like a, kind of a single guy. I was a single guy for a long time, so I can relate to having you know, a snowboard in the living room and um, just drinking a beer. It was two in the afternoon. Um, <laughs> you know, he said he worked all day. He deserved a beer. Fine. And then he said, you know, you're the kind of guy we could go have a beer together. And I said, yeah, sure. I'll have a Coke. I don't drink. But I don't know. It's just a personality thing. It clicked. So, hey, hey, nice. But that doesn't always happen. Usually, um, you know, you walk in with your uh, your clipboard and you're, um, you know, you're dressed up. People can be a little standoffish. In this case, it was not. That's awesome. So that's the most important piece right there is the relationship. And that's someone who... Max is going to have an easy time turning into an advocate, somebody who can refer him and be like part of his sphere and build this business bond right there is somebody who he connects with personally. That's huge. Thanks for sharing that, Max. That's really cool. 
and do one more. David, what do you think it was for a 759 Plaza Ampola? I think that her and Kelly didn't get along, but I don't know. <laughs> I'm not really sure what happened. She was Got she it. was pretty she was pretty eccentric. Yeah. She yeah. <laughs> She's like a detractor from Hillsborough. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah. I I am born as the seven five nine uh plaza ampola. Oh you and, did? Uh, okay. Yeah. So for them, I believe it was uh it was that they had been they've been they had tenants in there before, they were only paying like 50 or uh, maybe he's paying 70% of market rent. So it's the fact that we could be those bad guys for them and keep those uh, keep, and help them run it as a business as opposed to doing it as more of like a, a housing somebody that could turn into a business to really maximize their cash flow. Okay. Yeah. I missed it. I thought you meant the clawback. I get it. The, I meant the other one. I'm getting the property. Yeah. 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 I know <laughs> okay, what you're yeah. talking about. Yeah. I know yeah, what you're yeah, talking about. It. Yeah. Hopefully we get away from any of that kind of stuff. Um, okay. All right. Next, I want to walk you guys through pricing strategies. So this is something I want you guys to get really, really good at. And if you guys can get really good at this, it's going to help you tremendously with um, pricing listings as well as pricing rental properties. And so I use this strategy on every single one of the onboarding calls that I've done so far. Uh, on the one that I did for 248 Grow for Wills, I, I got the price knocked down 10% by just using by just explaining pricing strategies to her, not even giving a recommended price. I just told her pricing strategies. And, and at the beginning of the call, she told me she wanted 4,500. After I explained to her what the three different pricing strategies were, she said, you know what, actually I want 4,100 now. And then she came back to me by email later that day and said, hey, Kyle, I changed my mind again. I want to go higher. And then I said to her, hey, I want you to get $10,000 for the property. Whether it's 10,000 or 4,000, it, 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 it doesn't accomplish any of my goals. I want to see you being taken care of. And it comes down to strategy. <clears throat> and so if you want to change your strategy, that's okay. And she, since, since I gave her that response, then she wrote back again and said, no, you're right, actually, I want to keep the strategy we talked about. Let's move forward. I didn't talk to her about what price she should list at. I told her what are the different mindsets for pricing. And so I'm going to share this video from Sharon. He's going to walk through the different strategies. It's not a new thing. Um, I knew these before, but Sharon, I like how Sharon uh, describes it. So... What I did in all of your onboarding calls that I did was I said, hey, uh, Amber, did David walk you through the three different pricing strategies that we use? And Amber sat there for a second and thought, and she said, hmm, no, I don't, I don't, I don't remember him doing that. I, I don't think so. I said, okay, that's fine. Um, it is okay if I walk you through these strategies now? And she said, yeah, yeah, definitely walk me through the different pricing strategies. I said, okay, well, before I do, I want to make sure we both have an understanding of what fair market value is. So Amber, do you have an understanding of what fair market value is? Now, whether Amber said yes or no, I would have the same response. What I'm doing is I'm just letting her buy into the conversation so, so that she's engaged. And so she said in this scenario, she said, yeah, I think I, think I know what fair market value is. I was, like, I was like, perfect. Okay. So that means you understand that fair market value is only achieved when a buyer and a seller of goods or services agree upon a price and terms and actually transact. So you're in agreement on that. And she said, yeah, no, th exactly. That's exactly what it is. I said, perfect. And so I said, so we, uh, we both understand that fair market value cannot be achieved unless we have a landlord and a tenant who agree upon a price and actually sign a rental agreement and collect, start collecting rent. She said, yeah, exactly. She said, great, because I'm not going to rent your property. Dave is not going to rent your property. And so we can tell you what the perceived market value is, but ultimately we are not that person who's going to achieve that fair market value with you because we are not the actual person who's going to transact. She said, yeah, totally get it. Cool. Okay. I said, perfect. So now I want to walk you through these three strategies. So what these three strategies are, are first aspirational. What aspirational pricing is, is when you look at the perceived market value, the comparable rentals in the marketplace, and you say, hey, you know what? I'm going to price a little bit above these in order to get the highest price possible. Now, aspirational pricing will allow you to get the highest price possible. And if you hadn't done aspirational pricing, you might have never achieved that pricing. This pricing strategy is usually best for properties that have celebrity value or very unique in nature. Now, there, there are some downsides to aspirational pricing because you can get the highest price, but also with aspirational pricing, you typically are looking at longer vacancy time. 
and your tenant typically chooses you as opposed to you choosing your tenant. The reason being is you're kind of looking for a needle in the haystack. One person who's willing to pay a significantly higher price than every other but than everybody else. So does that make sense? They said perfect. Okay, number two is perceived market value. Perceived market value is when you again look at all those comparable rentals and you price your your home around the same area as those other rentals. The benefits of this are usually your best combination of vacancy time and having more than one application to choose from. And earlier in the call, you told me getting a good quality tenant was really important for you. So if we are wanting to make sure we get good quality, we wanna make sure we're picking for multiple applications and not having one person choose us. Okay, then last is invitational. Invitational pricing is when we look at those perceived market values again and price just below them. When we do invitational pricing, what we do is we make sure that we're gonna get by far the highest quality tenant in the marketplace. Reason being is because all the best quality tenants are going to apply for our rental property and we're gonna have our pick of the litter of these people. Now, when you do do invitational pricing, you do run the risk of getting a slightly lower rental price, but it is at the cost of having a better quality tenant. And that better quality tenant will also result in a lower vacancy cost and they'll most likely take better care of the property. So there's positive and negatives to each one of these. Which one to use seems like the best strategy. In my four uh, onboarding calls I did, I had only one person say aspirational. I had two people say perceived market value. And I said one person, and I had one person actually say invitational because I didn't tell them, hey, you need to go price it for 4,000. I said, these are the different strategies. Which one is sounds, which one seems most important to you? And then so they let them decide. And then once they decide, then you go back and then you say, okay, perfect. So the perceived market value based upon the other er other homes in this area, say between this range and this range. For a couple of the calls, I even showed them a couple of the houses. And I said, based upon seeing these and knowing you want to use the strategy of this strategy, where do you think it should be priced? And I let them choose. And so I shared how that works. So this, this is the language we're going to start using on the onboarding calls. So if you guys can start using the same language in your discussions, we are all gonna be very much in sync with how to price these properties. And then we're no longer gonna be at war with the landlords about what this rental price is. We're gonna be on the same team and we're gonna be utilizing strategies. Does anybody use this currently in their listing agreements? Yeah, when I present my my offers to them, it's, it's structured very much in the same way. One clawback that I had last year where where things started to get off the rails was in between the consultation that I did with her and onboarding, she decided that she wanted to have her cake and eat it too. She wanted to have the best quality tenant and the aspirational prices. And I think when it came time to onboarding, like it didn't get kind of circled back around like, okay, you realize you're going to give up. Like you, these two things don't coexist. You don't get the best tenant and the best price. So how do you want to balance it, right? And so in the in the lag time in between the presentation and the onboarding, she had created a fantasy world to live in. So maybe in the future, if there's like, you, you have a great talk track around it, which is awesome, but I would totally be okay with, you know, hey, let's get Justin on the phone and talk to him. What does he think about this, given what you guys talked about? Great feedback on that, Justin, because if somebody doesn't want to change their pricing strategy, it's like, okay, so you told Justin that you wanted to do perceived market value. Now you're saying you want to switch to aspirational. Should we get, so like, do we need to get Justin back in the conversation? And so the one person who chose aspirational pricing with me, I actually told the property manager that I said, Hey, they said they want to do aspirational. And I asked her, okay, so how long are you willing to give it to get that, to find that needle in the haystack? And she said, I'd like to give it like two weeks initially, and then we'll bump it down to this price for another two weeks. And then we'll go from there. And I said, okay, great. So I wrote that down as a no, read it back to her at the end of the call. And when I communicated to the property manager, I said, make sure to let me know if you get any pushback on this date, on these timelines, because we, she told me the timelines. I wrote it down. I repeated it back to her. So if you need me to re-communicate that to her, I'm happy to. And I included that in my follow-up email to her as well. So it, it's really helpful if we're all on the same page communicating that thing. And then like Justin said, able to push them back to the person that they that they said that to initially, because it's going to get away from those clawbacks and it's going to get it so that we're all on sync on the same team with the clients and never feeling like we're fighting them for the rental rate. Thanks for sharing that, Justin. That was helpful. Any other thoughts on this? I was going to say in the past, what I've done is I don't think I've done 
that specific aspirational pricing and listed all three of them. But I've usually given them a range that I believe, because I'm always saying that it's not an exact science. Um, so what I would say, here's, here's a range of, you know, X amount to X amount. If you price it here at the top, you're likely going to have it on the market a bit longer. At the bottom, you're probably going to get it rented out a little bit quicker. You know, based around that idea there, what's your thoughts on that? And kind of let them speak on what they think about, you know, those different pricing areas. Exactly. So just make sure they know it's all a strategy and, and the language. It's best if you guys can use the same language because then it's going to create cohesiveness. Um, but if you can't get the language, you can't get the exact wording down, then that's okay too. At least that we they can understand there's positive and negatives, but it's all a strategy. It's not that we're going to rent the property for that amount. Then we're, we're going to be aligned in our values there. And if you guys can get really good at this for your listings as well, then you'll be on the same team as your listings. And then now with these changes with buyers, use this with your buyers. Teach your buyers what the different pricing strategies are that sellers use. And that can that's going to make you sound like a very intelligent and informed buyer's agent because you can be like, hey, these are the different strategies that sellers are going to use. And then when you go see a house, say, hey, which, which pricing strategy do you think the seller just used? That's going to build a ton of value for you guys as buyer agents if you can if you can have that communication. Reference the new markets being launched. So we're in the process of launching um, Sonoma and San Joaquin. Um, so just again, wanted to reiterate to you guys that if we uh, that we do pay referral bonuses for inviting team members, two thousand dollars for any team member upon closing their first transaction, thousand dollars for any independent agent upon closing the first investment partner. They also go into your downline at Real Brokerage. Will just invited somebody to the team and is able to take advantage of this. So congratulations to Will. Um, Jay Esh as well. Jay Esh just had a, a team member sign on. They're going to be in the same boot camp together. Um, they're both doing investment partner. They're both going to be team agents. And so um, two members of the team already taking advantage of this. Max has done it in the past as well. Um, so really, really great job, you guys, referring people in. Um, other people are, are in the process of doing it as well. Marcus, we need leasing agents. So we uh, just had a leasing agent leave in Sacramento. So we we do still have one. So don't freak out, Lonnie. <laughs> We're still good. We still have somebody out there. Um, but we like to have two just because it's such a big region. So um, if you know anybody, any agents or people who are aspiring to become agents in the Stockton or Sacramento area, we are now hiring. So uh, please refer them in. Same referral bonuses and do apply. As always, please and tag your invalidations. Uh, David had a great question for us um, this past week on invalidations. Um, if you guys do get people who are calling in, basically saying, hey, I'm just kind of trying to find out what property management services are, and they're not actually interested in exploring it, they're not actually interested in meeting, you can invalidate those leads. Um, if they are kind of gray like that, please just give us a lot of notes in the on the CRM because the our vendor might push back on it. And the more information we have ahead of time, the more successful we'll be on getting those invalidated. You guys have been doing a great job on the CRM statuses, but again, always please only use junk if it's a wrong phone number or bad contact info. Otherwise, we want to, if they're not interested, we still want to nurture those people as, as buyers and sellers in the future. On the contract changes, I wanted to applaud you guys, actually. I thought this was going to be a bigger change than it was. You guys, we've already signed up, been signing up accounts at this new format. Has anybody had any experience explaining it so far that they want to uh, share? I've explained it many times, probably eight, nine times by now. I haven't signed up any clients since this change has gone into effect, but I've explained it plenty and they get it. Yeah. Yeah. I explained it once and she's, she seemed to be like, yeah, okay. That makes sense. And I think it's nice. It's like, yeah, the first month we take a big chunk, but the next, what is it? Five months or yeah, the next five months, there's no deductions. So they're actually like, well, that actually sounds kind of cool. So, yeah. Yeah, that's been, that's both of your guys' experience has been my experience as well. I've explained it three times now. Each time the person's reaction was, okay. <laughs> my, my question, Kyle, is let's say we have someone that buys a property with us and then they want us to manage it out and yeah. we offer them the six months free. Will they just pay six months up front and then the rest of the year is free? No, they just that the no that the basically them doing the transaction took care of that customer acquisition cost for that startup cost for us. So there, there's no how would that no, work? How do we tell them how we're gonna charge them? They just get six months free and in month seven, just normal normal management fee start. Okay. So they just so sign up initial, and then on the yeah, six that, month that, they'll start getting billed. 
Okay, I got you. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Perfect. For those, those ones are almost the easiest. But if you guys are struggling with it, um, chat with myself or Austin or Jayesh or somebody who's been working with it. And I've had like zero reaction from it. So <laughs> everyone just seems like that seems right. That seems fair. Because um, they, they don't know any different, right? Kyle, what I'm curious about though is, is if I was unable to sign up one or two of my potential clients because of that pricing strategy. Now, how do we determine, how do we figure that out? Like if they're saying like, Hey, I just want to move forward because of this. Right. Like, like if internally they decided not to move forward because of this. If you know that, and that's a sticking point, just reach out to Brett, we will make exceptions. But if people are being like that challenging, they're probably somebody who's going to result in the clawback or something like that in the future. So the, if somebody's being that challenging on a sticking point like that, they might not be the best people for us to work with already. We will most likely make exceptions. Um, and we're not doing this on multifamilies too. So, um, uh, okay. Sorry. Let me, um, let me, let me rephrase. I don't think I thought it was clear. I'm curious and I don't know if you've experienced this. I'm curious if any of my potential clients have decided not to move forward because of this pricing strategy where they don't, where we collect the, the six months up front on the first month and then resume collecting on month seven. They understand it. They get that, aha, you're front loading half of your fees. Okay. And, but I'm curious how many of them may thought that was their deciding factor not to sign with us. You, you'd only know that by when they said, Hey, I'm not moving forward. And you said, you know, could, could I have some feedback on what, what may helped you make that decision? Um, if you're getting a lot of that feedback, let's, let's talk more about it. Um, I haven't heard anybody like that yet. And again, like our, most people charge a leasing fee on top of the monthly management to overcome this problem. And we're just doing it as a front loading the fee instead. So if they compare apples to apples, they'll see that we're actually charging significantly less on the overall fee. Most property management companies solve this problem. They do it through a lease up fee. Um, I've been going on my onboardings. I've been going crazy on the AB12 and people have loved it. So I definitely recommend doing it guys. Beginning July 1, landlords can only charge one month's rent for security deposits. I always say like, hey, we're going to stay on top of the laws for you guys, and just making sure we're in compliance. And so, for example, there's this crazy law coming out July 1. I don't know if you've heard of it yet, but starting July 1, landlords can only charge one month's rent for security deposits. What we're doing to combat that is um, if there are pets allowed at the property, we're charging pet rent instead of pet deposits. Um, but I just can't believe California is always changing these things on us. Right. And like every person's had the same reaction is like, they've been like, Oh my God, I know California is the worst with these laws and we have a good laugh and they appreciate that we're staying on top of them. And like all of them are annoyed by this. Like this isn't an annoying law, but it doesn't hurt them that much. So it's like a great one to show your value and to discuss about. That's a hot button that like, they like to talk about. I've had really, really good experience discussing with everybody. Again, you guys have the contact templates and your automated follow-ups now. So please do use those templates because they're going to include the links for your uh, PowerPoints and your PDFs. Um, and those, this is an example of what those look like. And then you also have that nurture email that you can tag with nurture CNC email plan. And that'll allow you to start, um, that'll have automated nurture start hitting that client. A couple quick questions in the chat. One was um, combo lock boxes, but how do they get them? Uh, the other was, can you email the video uh, that you were sharing with Sharon? And uh, can they also get the deck? Uh, if we're setting up a lockbox or a Supra, please only use a contractor lockbox. Email, yes, absolutely, always. Uh, I will email the video afterwards. And yes, I will send out an email. And you know what I'll do? I'll put in the body of the email with the video. I'll include Sharon's video. You'll have the recording to this video, and then I'll also write out those three pricing strategies, so that way we have everything, and I'll also get you a link, yeah, to the slideshow, absolutely, um, in that email. Awesome. Well, uh, thanks for a great call, as always, guys, and uh, reach out with any questions. Let's close some more investment partner deals. Take care, everybody.